Well, hello again, and welcome to day seven of our study together in God's Word. As we pick up where we left off last time, we have been going through the book of Genesis, and we've so far seen creation, the fall, we have seen the beginning of the flood, we saw the deliverance in the ark yesterday. Now, as we come to Genesis chapter 8, we need to remember that these chapters have been chosen because they all help contribute to our understanding of God's Word and what God is doing in mankind and the message He has for us. And so right now, we are more towards the end of the flood. We're still going to go to Genesis 9 and have one more chapter as we look at the remaining portion of God's covenant with Noah. But as we've looked at these passages so far, we are seeing that God has brought his justice and his wrath upon sin. And we're seeing what it looked like with the flood. But when we come to passage like this, we're so accustomed to trying to find a personal application for ourselves that we often run the danger of reading too much into a passage and trying to find some kind of hidden spiritual meaning for us. And then we walk away with an incorrect understanding of the text. And so I think that this passage is an example of how that can happen. Because it's filled with some really neat stuff that we're going to talk about. But we have to be careful that we don't want to make this text about us in our modern day life. And and there's some kind of specific way, like if you just had pet doves, you'd be a more godly person. or, Or something silly like that. We want to avoid that kind of mindset. We want to go through this word to understand what it's telling us about God and Noah and the events that actually transpired, and then also seek to make valid application to our life. So with that as a backdrop, let's go into just a quick overview of Genesis 8. You have two main events going on here. You have the the abating of the waters, and you also have what I'm going to call the regenesis of man. Man is being placed back onto the land, and now God is starting over with a new godly person and hopefully a new godly lineage. So in terms of the the sequence and the opening verses, uh, the waters begin to recede in verse 3. After 16 days, the ark rests on the land in verse 4. After 60 days, the tops of the mountains begin to appear in verse 5. Then after 40 more days, Noah begins to work on an exit plan, and that's going to take another couple months. But we're going to see that that's just his plan, that he has to wait till the Lord tells him to get out of the ark. And then once they come off the ark in verse 18, all the animals come off the ark as well. In verse 20, Noah builds an altar to the Lord. He offers this pleasing sacrifice to the Lord. And in verse 21, the Lord begins what we call the Noahic covenant. And this is going to then spill into Genesis chapter 9. And so we're going to touch upon that a little bit today, but mostly that tomorrow. So let's go back and just kind of glance over this passage a little bit more. Back in verse 1, it tells us that God remembered Noah. That doesn't mean that God forgot Noah. It just is a biblical way of saying God is now returning back to his plan, and God is going to do something that's glorious and miraculous. We know from Isaiah 49, 15 and 16, that God never forgets us. He says, can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. And so the Lord does not forget his people. He did not forget Noah here. He has been working out his divine plan all along. But think about the situation, though. It seems to be that there has been now a silence between the Lord and Noah for well over a year. Depending on how long we count months, Noah's been on the ark for anything between 363 to 375 days. Uh, Sometimes people think that Noah's only on the ark for 40 days because the initial downpour of rain was for 40 days and 40 nights, but it was a much longer time than that. So about a little over a year. And it seems as though Noah is not getting any further communication from the Lord. He is sitting there on this ark with his family going up and down on these waves, waiting for God's guidance, waiting for any kind of hope. But it seems that day after day, the sun rises, the sun sets, darkness comes, then the next day comes, and there's been silence. And all of this, Noah has been waiting patiently for the Lord. We sometimes talk about the patience of Job. But we're seeing here in Genesis 8 that Noah was a profoundly patient man. But returning back to verse 1, God's plan for the flood has now been satisfied. And in verse 1, he he causes a wind to blow over the earth. And then the waters begin to subside. And when you think about what this would be like, here there's been silence. Uh, There's just them left on this globe. And they're going up and down with the waves. 
and suddenly this incredible wind kicks in and it's blowing them around. It's you got these then massive waves and these massive seas and they're wondering what is going on. And in that turmoil, the Lord is working out the solution. He is working out his salvation for Noah and his family. God is in control of this whole event. Proverbs 30 verse 4 says the Lord keeps the wind in his fist. Psalm 135 verse 7 says he takes them from his treasuries. In Psalm 148 verse 8, they fulfill his word. And so God has been doing all of this. This is all by his divine plan. And as terrifying as it was, it was ultimately the best place for them to be. Along the same lines in verse 2, the the source of the water, the skies are closed up, the fountains from the deep are closed on up. Then in verse 3, the waters begin to recede. And it's interesting to note that they took about 150 days to recede. And we know from back in chapter 7, verse 24, they were increasing for about 150 days. And, And although that was a staggering long period of time, God had a plan in all of it. And sometimes we we are in these situations that life brings our way, and often, even when God is working, it's not going to be an immediate solution to our situation. It may take time, it may take days, it may take months, and it may even take years. So as we move on in this passage, in verse 4, we see that 16 days have now passed. On the 17th day, the ark rests on a mountain. The waters are continuing to recede for another couple more months. The tops of the mountains become visible in verse 5. In verse 7, Noah sends out a raven. And then a dove in verse 8. The dove comes back, sends her back out again in verse 10. She brings back an olive leaf. He sends her back out in verse 12. And this time, she doesn't come back. Now, it's interesting when you look at this whole sequence, though, because Noah has gone through all of this stuff, sending out the birds and looking out the window and probably talking with his family. And we might say, well, what principles can we take away from divine guidance here? And we miss the obvious principle. The obvious principle is that although the Lord had instructed Noah about making the ark, and he remember he gave him the details, even told him when the water is going to start coming. Once Noah is on the ark... The Lord doesn't tell Noah about when the waters are going to go away. He doesn't tell Noah about, hey, it's going to be another two more months. Hang on, chill out, wait. And I find it fascinating that the Lord told Noah the details that were necessary for survival. But he doesn't tell him the details that are necessary just to give his heart ease. All along, Noah just has to trust the Lord and know that God loves him. God has protected him. God has provided this entire miraculous situation. Noah has never left the hand of God, and he is just now called to trust him. I can only imagine how discouraging this would have been to Noah. God had been talking to him, and now he was silent. There are times when the Lord is going to be working in our life, but we're not going to really know what he's doing. That's okay. And if we find that to be our situation, we're in good company with the example of Noah. Well, going on into verse 13. In verse 13, Noah sees the dry ground. He's ready to get on out. You know, you can imagine. He's like, hey, everybody, let's get to the door. Let's go. But they wait for clarity from the Lord. And so although they could leave, they wait to hear from the Lord. And he doesn't tell them until verse 15 and 16 that it's time to leave the ark. And so Noah obeys the Lord. And in verse 20, he builds an altar to the Lord. Shows us just a priority of worship. And then in verse 21, God makes this promise to Noah that we're going to talk about more tomorrow. But it's an important promise. It's the Noahic covenant. And he promises to not destroy all of man or all of creation again. And that right there is the the heart of the gospel. Because we just saw that it is just for God to destroy the earth with a flood. But for his promise not to do that anymore means that there is some other means of justice that's going to be satisfied. And we know that even that small comment is ultimately pointing to the cross because only with his wrath satisfied on the cross could he make a promise like this even to Noah. So when we go into our day for the rest of the day, uh, let's remember the reality of God's wrath. God's wrath is real and it must be satisfied. Here we're seeing it satisfied with the flood Ultimately, it's satisfied with the cross. Likewise, we all go through dark nights. We're all going to go through times where it seems like we're alone on on an ark, just going up and down with the waves, and we don't know what's going on. But God is working, and we need to trust him and watch for him and wait for him. 
So those are some thoughts for this passage. It's a powerful example of God's wrath, God's mercy, God's providence, God's blessings. And just as a great reminder that we serve an awesome and holy God who we must fear and worship and love, knowing that he is good and loving and gracious to us. And if we're in Christ, the wrath that we see here will never fall upon us because it's already fallen upon our Savior. And with that, we could celebrate and praise our Lord. Hope you have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless.